Hi, my name is Elsa Sunset. I'm a stroke neurologist and today I'm talking to you from my house just outside of Oslo. I have the great pleasure of interviewing Gordian Hubert today uh, and we will be talking about uh, the results of a very interesting project that he has just presented in the large clinical trial session at the virtual ESOP 2021. So Gordian, can you please tell us a bit about yourself first? Yes, thank you, Elsie. I'm Gordon Hubert. I'm a stroke neurologist and I work uh, in Munich in Bavaria in the south of Germany. And um, I work in the München Clinic Halaching, um, but my main job is uh, really to take care of a network, of a telestroke network. So we support rural hospitals in rural Bavaria via telemedicine, via quality management and knowledge transfer. So Gordian, you've done something very interesting and you've moved the team of interventionalists uh, from your hospital to different rural hospitals rather than moving the patient. So can you tell me a bit about how this project came about? Yeah, sure. Um, as, I, as I told you, we have this very decentralized system. So, so all these patients are really treated in their local hospitals uh, for stroke care. But when the trials came up for EVT and showed how efficient EVT is, we were in real trouble because um, we'd really have to see how can we treat these patients with this new evidence-based uh, therapy. So we and set up this project where we um, set up a team of interventionists and their assistants in the, in the center and also set up a helicopter service that was available um, for just for this network. And whenever we identified a patient that was in need of EVT, we would alarm the team and the helicopter, and they would jump in the helicopter and fly out there to perform thrombectomy out there in these local hospitals. Uh, after the treatment, they would return and the patient would stay there for further care. So we reversed, as you said, uh, the system. We do not move the patient, but we move the team out there. Now, the whole uh, point of this project is to save time because it, it takes such a long time to do this drip and ship model and to actually um, transfer the patient, to stabilize him, uh, to transfer him to the center, re-evaluate him again, again, then put him in the angio and then start the procedure. So that was our main intention. Um, now, coming to the results uh, that I just presented, they are about um, the first three years of the project. And uh, there were uh, a lot of encouraging results we found there. First is uh, we saw that whenever we used the flying intervention team um, um, instead of the drip and ship team, we would... Um, um, we would have a much higher percentage of actually performing EVT in the end. So 84% versus only 65 in those that were transferred. Um, also, we saw that we have a vast time difference. Um, so from the decision for thrombectomy until groin puncture, we're about one and a half hours shorter with the flying intervention team than when we actually move the patient to the center. Um, third, we saw that there's no safety concern. So our in-hospital complications, our periprocedural complications were low in both groups. And last, we looked at the modified ranking scale, the functional outcome after three months, and we see um, a trend towards a better outcome uh, in, the, uh, in these patients that were treated with the flying intervention team compared to the drip and ship team. It does not reach statistical significance. We have a p-value of 0 0.07, but the direction is, um, is very clear. So these are very encouraging results um, for this kind of model. Absolutely, I think it's very encouraging. What do you think, there was a difference in the percentage of EVT being performed in, in the control and in the, in the intervention group, if you can say it that way. Uh, what, what are your explanations for, for this difference? Uh, I'm sure you've given this quite a lot of thought. <laughs> yes, of course. I mean, we looked at that uh, um, more closely. We, we see that uh, in patients that are transferred, roughly, 19, no, roughly 20% actually have a recanalization or a clinical improvement that is, that is so uh, important that you would not uh, do EVT anymore. So that's one part. But we also see almost 10% of the patients um, where the new team in the center deemed that EVT was 
futile, either because the CT uh, um, was uh, was so hypodense already, or because there was no um, um, perfusion um, uh, left over, so no penumbra left over, so that they would stay away from EBT. So that's another 10% of these patients, really. And that is, of course, quite uh, perhaps quite related to the time delay as well that you actually have uh, transfers, transferring the patient. A- absolutely, yes. Uh, and when it comes to uh, what, what were your major challenges in this project? I think uh, a lot of people would. Uh, worry a bit about coming to a new hospital, coming to a new lab, performing a, a, a complicated procedure uh, in, in an unknown environment. So I would assume that would be one of your one of the challenges. What were the major major challenges you had to overcome in order to actually get this project running and care carried out? Mm-hmm. Well, yes, this certainly was one of the challenges, but also we had to prepare all these hospitals to be ready to treat uh, EVT patients uh, after the procedure, but also while during the procedure. So we did a lot of training sessions and a lot of standards that were set up for them and individual protocols for each hospital um, to make them really ready for this kind of procedure. Um, so when the project started, it was very interesting and, and relieving for us to see also that this part worked really well. So from the beginning, from the very first uh, patient we actually had and we flew to, uh, we saw that they had prepared everything. The patient was completely prepared when the team arrived, the kit was opened uh, and everything. So they could start straight away with the groin puncture. So that was a lot of um, effort to actually get them to the standard that, that we obviously want for these patients. The second thing is, of course, as you said, um, As an interventionist, now I'm not an interventionist, but as an interventionist, you don't know what to expect out there. They all, of course, had to be acquainted with all the uh, angio suites. So they drove out there and looked at all the situations and uh, and worked with the angios so to be sure that they can uh, use them well. But then again, this is a completely new project, so you you wouldn't know what what to expect really. But quite quite soon we saw that. It is not associated with the high complication rate. It usually works very well, very smooth. The team is very motivated out there. So they got more confident uh, after the months. And, and were the labs, uh, from what I understood, the labs were not, uh, they were not just the biplane or dual plane labs. There were different types of labs, also monoplanes. There were quite some differences in, in how, how, how the interventionists ha- had to work and how they had to get acquainted uh, uh, with the different uh, different uh, angio, angio suites, I, I, I would uh, suspect. Uh, that, that's true. They're actually only monoplanar. Um, angio suites out there so so the, um, there was no dual planar and they had to to work with these um, with these angios yeah um, so it is different actually but we looked at the recanization rate as well and we saw that um, that is is very high I mean they they achieved um, more than 90 percent recanization rate in those where they uh, where they attempted EVT uh, and that was similar to those in the center and in, in the time periods where you moved, uh, in, in the weeks where you moved, where you had the team running, uh, did you do all co- uh, all procedures, EVT procedures for or all thrombectomies in, in the rural hospitals? Or were there certain cases that were seemed very complicated that you thought would, uh, were there any patients that you, you thought we, we need to bring these to our comprehensive center because the procedure is likely very complicated, we might need stents, uh, there might be additional complications. Um, did you have anything of that like in, that, in your protocol? Yes, yes, we did. Uh, but there's much more than that, actually. I mean, th- th- those are very rare cases that you could describe now. But what we actually had, we had weather conditions where we couldn't fly or the team was uh, on call in a, in a different hospital at the same time. So we couldn't uh, use the flying intervention team at that point. Um, or at the beginning of the helicopter, even the the, uh, the the time the helicopter was once broken, so we couldn't use it for for half a day. So there are various um, obstacles that that are difficult with this system and that prevented the team from actually flying out there. So we have um, patients that could not be treated with this project, although it actually would have been available, but it wasn't at the time when the patient arrived. I think, I think that yeah. exemplifies the very the, the 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 
pragmatic real world nature uh, of, of, of your, your study and which is also probably needed in uh, when we do service delivery trials because uh, we are not running in a perfectly smooth environment where everything works the, 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 the way we want that at all times. So what do you think is the the future for this? And how should, for example, people in different cities, different countries, different regions uh, interpret your results? And how do we move forward? Yes, well, thank you. I mean, this is, um, um, I I really want to encourage um, people to to set up systems like that as well. We don't have enough data yet to say this is what everyone should have. We're far away from that. This is not a randomized controlled trial. This is a prospective observational um, a study, so we can talk about association, but not about effect. So, so I really want to encourage other groups to set this kind of project up, so that we can share data, that we know more about which hospitals are the right ones to to include in such a systems. What's the distance really? Um, uh, does it count for all distances, or only for the very long distances, or the very short? I don't know. So, so we really need to do more research on this, and and I, I hope there are other people joining in. I'm absolutely sure there are. You, you are you are right in the center of some of these very important questions that we have at the moment. Which patients are going where or are we moving ourselves to different locations? So I would like to congratulate you, Gordian, on a great project and uh, thank you very much. And I look forward to seeing you in Lyon next year. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, Elsie.